All right, so I'm Will Pringle. I'm a uh, software developer at Distributive. We are a startup building DCP. I'm gonna talk about DCP today, how it's going to basically be the like, future of compute, um, go through the API, as well as kind of the rationale for why it exists and why you should all be very excited about it. Before I get into that, I'm gonna summarize the product. DCP is a platform, it's, it's kind of a, a marketplace, let's say, that connects people with idle computers that they aren't using to researchers and developers that need compute. Anyway, so this is a marketplace kind of like Airbnb that connects these idle computers that aren't being used to people that need to use compute. Um, so, you know, like Airbnb, you have, you know, let's say you rent out your apartment. This would be you rent out a portion of your computer for someone to do, let's say, AI research on. This presentation is just gonna go over kind of the problem. I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about it. Um, some opportunities, and then why DCP is the solution, as well as shows a cool live demo at the end. So, the state of compute in 2023. I'm sure you've all been hearing a lot about the chip shortage, like on news and all of that stuff. However, at the same time, Demand for compute is always increasing. Um, uh, I'll talk about one industry or one field that you're probably familiar with that uses a lot of compute, which is, let's say, Bitcoin mining. I think there was a figure, something like the power and the electricity used to uh, generate Bitcoin uh, used more, I think, per year than the country of Norway. And in order to use that much power, that means it's using a lot of compute. Uh, another thing that's been huge recently is the AI boom. Training these models, like what OpenAI does with ChatGPT and GPT-4, GPT-3.5, you know, all of that stuff is, is hard. And it costs a lot of money. Something like the demand for AI compute increases by a factor of two. It doubles every three to four months. Think about how insane that is. As a result, compute is expensive now, and it's not as reachable to a lot of people. Organizations are over budget by 23% on average for cloud spend. Executives estimate that 30% of cloud spending is wasted. Organizations expect cloud spending to increase by almost 50%. Governments want to optimize their cloud spending. And then that figure I said before, every three and a half months, demand for AI compute doubles. That's insane. And if, if you're not familiar with compute and think that's a bit of an abstract concept, compute is required for like anything you do pretty much. If you're on your phone and uh, you're using Google Maps, a lot of code is being executed on a server. If you're using Pinterest, all of those files are located in the cloud. This is compute. This is using somebody else's server located most of the time on AWS's uh, uh, server rooms. But we need this compute so much and it's hard and you know, it has to be an AWS server room or, or Google server room or Microsoft server room. But when you look around campus, you see hundreds of computers that aren't being used. You know, they're just sitting around there waiting for someone in a lab to use them. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, why can't we harness that compute power? If there's a chip shortage, but we have all these devices with chips in them that aren't doing anything. Isn't that a problem? How can we take advantage of that? That seems like an obvious problem that should have been solved by now, right? Turns out it's a really hard problem. Computers are, you know, very different. I don't know for any of the computer science students here, when you compile code and execute it on different computers, it breaks. There's different system APIs, stuff doesn't work. Uh, different operating systems, you know, let's say Windows versus Mac. You can't run the same programs on Mac that you can on Windows. Uh, you know, FreeBSD, Linux, random firmware for certain devices. Uh, different CPUs, uh, computers could just be, you know, different in age. Like uh, the computers of 2023 are pretty different from the computers in 2013, but those 2013 computers are still valuable. Uh, different GPUs, etc. And then, even if we are somehow able to harness 
this idle compute and let people upload their code to execute on it, there's some pretty serious security vulnerability problems with that. We're told never to run untrusted code, right? That's how you get viruses. If uh, you go to some random website and you download a .exe file and then run it on your computer, like you're gonna get malware. So how do we solve this? Because we need compute, we have all of this idle compute doing nothing that we could harness, but we've got these problems. Well, keep that in your mind. Let's step back for a moment and think about the web browser. Okay, you all use Google Chrome, you know, Firefox, Edge every day. You know, maybe you even use apps that are built using React Native, which kind of use a type of web browser. And when you're using these, these browsers, I mean, first thing, they, they work on pretty much all your devices. You've got one on your phone, uh, like smart TVs will have browsers. Like I remember my PS3 had like a, a really shitty browser. But when you're using them, you don't worry about the code that's being executed in them. When, when you think about it, web pages are like programs. They're code that's executing within the browser, but you don't have to worry about it. You, you can go to the, like literally the sketchiest websites in the world and you don't have to worry about getting a virus. I mean, unless you download a .exe file and run it, you know, something like that. Or unless you get phished. But you don't have to worry about that code executing on your computer, like uh, stealing your data or injecting malware, stuff like that. Sure, there's possibly some you know, zero day exploits, some, some vulnerabilities in Google Chrome or Firefox, but we use them so often and those are so important that so much energy is being poured into uh, keeping browsers safe by Microsoft, Apple, uh, Mozilla, um, and, and more companies. I'll also mention this, uh, code in the browsers, it's getting a lot faster. Uh, again, huge R&D budgets from you know, Apple, Google, et cetera, pouring money into the browsers to make them as fast as possible. So is that the solution? We can use web browsers to harness this idle compute power and then just execute the code in the browser. That doesn't sound exactly right. There's kind of an elephant in the room. Okay, raise your hand if you hate JavaScript. Okay, we've got a lot of JavaScript fans. Okay, one, thank you. Okay, two, okay. But we've got a lot of JavaScript fans here. Fair enough, I actually am a JavaScript fan, I love it. But I have a question. Would you use JavaScript for machine learning? No way. Would you use uh, JavaScript for extremely fast, uh, low-level code? No. Ha. But JavaScript is the only language that runs on the web, right? No. That's not the case anymore. That hasn't been the case for a few years now. Uh, in 2017, and then it's been much more standardized in the past few years, WebAssembly has enabled us to use any programming language in the web browser. You could compile Rust into a .wasm file instead of a .exe and run that code in a browser. JavaScript isn't the only language, and not only that, but there's another new API that just got added to Google Chrome, I wanna say two or three months ago, that's gonna change the browser in terms of machine learning. It's called WebGPU. It's a new API for accessing the GPU. For those who may not be in computer science or may not be AI experts, you need to access the GPU to do any real sort of machine learning or AI training or even serving. GPUs allow for extremely quick linear algebra and math to be performed. And up until now, there wasn't really a good way to access that within the web. A nice standard way didn't exist until now with WebGPU. Again, it was just rolled out. It's still being worked on, literally just added to Google Chrome. It's still experimental in Firefox and Safari. So uh, another thing I'll add is that web browsers can actually be split up into multiple components. So you may not care about if you're just running someone else's like random code on your computer, you probably don't care about rendering the screen or like having a UI. 
So there's actually a, a separate component of a browser called a JavaScript engine. And JavaScript engines, uh, despite the name, run WebAssembly. So anyways, I think we've kind of got onto our solution, right? Browsers and, and JavaScript engines, let's say, run on pretty much any computer. We can depend on the type of security that we would have in Google Chrome. Uh, you don't need to code in JavaScript anymore. It's 2023. You can, you can code in C++ or Python you know, in the browser because you could uh, compile a Python interpreter to WebAssembly and then run your Python code in it and then use any of the AI libraries you want. And now we have finally a good standard API to access the GPU. So, I think it's pretty obvious what DCP is now. It's the way to do distributed compute in, uh, in, uh, in 2023, uh, or it will be, uh, because we haven't launched quite yet, but I, I, I think that you're all seeing the excitement here and you should all be paying attention to DCP. It provides a marketplace where people can run a JavaScript engine on their computer, and then other people who need their compute to be done can deploy it, and DCP, kind of like Airbnb with, uh, with people needing a place to stay for the night, will schedule that code to run on other people's computers. Security, uh, it, you know, again, isn't a concern, which is so important because other projects like, let's say, Folding at Home or, or these uh, SETI at Home, um, which were other big computing projects using other people's computers, you had to trust the code running on your computer. This, no longer the case. Um, I'll also show the API. Now, we'll have multiple APIs. This just happens to be the JavaScript SDK. I'm a JavaScript fan, but there's also a Python one. Um, I'll use this laser pointer. This is how easy it is to use DCP. You don't have to worry about the underlying computer. You don't have to worry about uh, making sure that it runs across different you know, architectures. You just define your data. In this case, it's numbers. You define the function that you want to operate on each one of these pieces of data. Let's call them slices. And then you run compute.4 with your data and your work function. Your data is then distributed across multiple computers, comes back when you get it. But I, I find when I explain this to people, they find that concept a little abstract. Okay, it's not really that useful to square numbers. And frankly, it would be really slow to do this on DCP. You know, these four numbers, you could square um, pretty much in instantaneously just on your computer. You wouldn't need to use DCP for this. Um, oh, sorry. I'll go back to that later. But I'm going to talk about one use case that we've actually implemented. So we have a product that we created that uses DCP called Overwatch. What Overwatch does is simplify machine vision inferencing for people that, I don't know, have idle compute that they can do the inference on or they just need it to be cheaper than AWS or something like that. And the way that works is that instead of having those numbers like in that previous example that we distributed, you could maybe have images. Um, one example is, let's say you have security cameras across, uh, let's say, your university campus. And you want to detect for forest fires. So you're using a machine learning model that can look at an image and it will tell you, hey, it looks like a forest fire has started here. And you can basically upload each of those frames from that security camera as it's pumping them out to DCP. And then DCP will send those frames to computers to, be, uh, to, uh, to run the machine learning model over the image and spit back if there's a forest fire or not. This is a, a way to, at scale, do inferencing. However, another use case, this is a kind of a theoretical use case. You know, we haven't built this yet. I did a demo of it, but it's totally possible, is distributed compiling. Let's say you're a software company 
and you have a large C++ code base. It can take a really long time to compile it. I don't know if any of you have ever compiled large C, C++ projects. It's really slow. If you could take advantage of the computers in your office building, because maybe you don't want your source code to be sent to some random guy's uh, computer who's, who's using his computer for you know, idle compute to make some money. Let's say you just want to set it within your office for you know, intellectual property reasons. And you have all these you know, computers that developers are using to spread it out. You, you could deploy your code to be compiled kind of in parallel on all these different computers and come back. It will help the developers focus on what's important instead of waiting for slow build times. Um, so anyways, that's one potential use case. But I mean, really, there's endless use cases. DCP is an API for general compute. So you can do a lot of things with it. I, I mentioned AI inferencing. Uh, I mentioned squaring numbers, which is a really dumb use case. And I mentioned you know, maybe distributed compiling. But there's a lot you can do. Maybe just for fun, a little demo. If anyone's interested, if you want to see what it's like to do some compute, execute someone else's code on your computer, you can head to this website, dcp.work, and I'll have a QR code for it if you want to do it on your phone, because it works on your phone. And you can execute someone else's work. I think there's some research on it right now, um, and, uh, and, and you'll see the slices being executed. Now, it might slow down your computer a little bit, but let's say you're at class, you, you go to class for the day, you leave your computer uh, executing other people's jobs, and it's earning profit for you. It's like, imagine if you have a, a gaming computer at home. You're into that, you have a GPU in it, and you're not using it during the day or maybe while you sleep. You could earn money by having other people compute their work on your system. Uh, th th this is a demo site. It doesn't deposit funds into your account. And in fact, you know, we're a startup. We haven't launched this product yet. We don't have payouts yet that's going to come with launch. But if you're interested and want to get on it early, you could sign up on portal.distributed.network and, uh, and start doing other people's compute. Um, and, and that kind of brings up a good point. This is not a cryptocurrency. This is not related to crypto at all. Um, but you can kind of see the parallels there. Okay, that's, that's pretty much everything, but maybe I didn't explain it as well as I could have. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I expect like, people to be able to earn from, you know, like cloud libraries to host something. How much? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it totally depends. If, if you have like a, you know, a bunch of servers, you'd be making a serious amount of money. If you just have maybe one slow Raspberry Pi, like not so much. It, it's hard to determine at the moment until we launch and see how much people are willing to pay for jobs. Um, but uh, you know, it, it it it'll be more than the cost of electricity. So you know, you will be making like a profit ideally, or you wouldn't be using it. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, yep. So basically, if you have a lower end uh, laptop or computer, and you want to still execute high level of program, yeah. So you will ask this uh, this program to execute it on other people's laptop, yeah. Or other people's uh, server. Yeah. and uh, get the result. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And even if you have a really fast computer, there's some work that you just can't do on it. Yeah. Like, for instance, any website, you know, it's not running on a, lap on a laptop. Pinterest isn't running on a laptop. They need to use services like this or like AWS in order to have a usable platform that doesn't take a thousand years to show them an image. That's an excellent question. Uh, does anyone else have any? Yeah. Uh, what like security measures are you guys taking if someone wants to execute a virus on this one? Awesome question. So you wouldn't want a hacker to submit some code to DCP that's just meant to exploit your computer. So kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier with web browsers. If you're on Google Chrome, you can go to the sketchiest website in the world that JavaScript or that WebAssembly can run on your computer, and you don't have to worry. It's kind of the same thing with DCP. 
We use the exact same technology. In fact, we use a component of Google Chrome called V8, which executes ja uh, JavaScript and WebAssembly in a secure environment. And uh, the code is very sandbox and kind of safe. Uh, thanks so much for the question. I love talking about how we have the security of the browser. Um, any other questions? Cool. Well, in, in this part of the talk, uh, it's kind of just going to be like office hours. Um, you know, I want to use this as an opportunity to talk to potential users and see what they think of the product, what kind of API they'd like. Also, just for networking. Uh, please add me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're shy and you want to, you know, maybe have some ideas or you're interested in the product, you can DM me there. Um, or if you want to stick around and uh, ch oh, oh. <laughs> well, we'll go on LinkedIn. You know, you'll see me. Uh, or if you want to stick around and just, you know, chat or hang out for the next thirty minutes, that's cool too. Uh, thanks everyone.